All right. <clears throat> um, this might be out of sync, but I have a, a theory about how to get I, a stupid movie into not fucking up the audio synchronization. You have to make a long video to really notice it, so. And this is something I'm going to want to post no matter what. So, here's the thing. I'm, I'm going, I want to start my first uh, attempt at a group philosophy. Well, not my first, like I, in college I started something called the Disassociation of February 29th. But um, this would be, I guess, my second attempt at making a group philosophy, right? I, like I have relativistic skepticism and I believe and encourage other people to give names to their philosophies. I, I like that whether the philosophy is good or not. You know, it's like, clarify what it's about. That's what I support, clarifying what your philosophy is about. I think that's beneficial. Uh, it attracts some people, but only those predisposed towards it. It repels other people that aren't predisposed towards it. Where if it's blurry, yeah, maybe people are attracted because the person is smiling a certain way. You know, so screw that. So what this is, is it's, um, I'm going to call it a semi-urgical thinking or the semi-urge or something like this. Uh, it's a play on Demerge, which Barclord used recently. Um, Demerge is a great word, but it's also a little bit polluted by... It, it, Plato used it, and so Christianity being Platonism for the masses used that, and it can just kind of mean like a god like God, capital T, Christian God, but it also just means the uh, productive force, the constructive, rather, force of, of nature, of the universe. But I like semi-urge, because now demi-urge originally comes from like a public worker or a skilled worker, something like that, where semi-urge semi -urge means, um, according to me, a part-time worker. So it's the philosophy of the part-time worker, and if Bob or any sub-geniuses notice that I'm stealing a vibe, just consider that it's generational. This is the new of, because, you know, the, the semi-worker idea, we, that's, that's what we have to go, part-time worker philosophy. You know what I'm saying? Now, we're saying life is productive. If you can be productive through part-time work and uh, so it's it's a not an anti-natalist it's a pro-choice position it is somewhat the idea of its position you know it's related it, but it's bigger than this but it's related to you know anti-natalism because I see anti-natalism is you have anti-choice where an individual thinks they can decide what's right or wrong for other people in in reproductive matters or in general or something. Now they might also be pro-choice in that they think that even though I could figure it out, that person has to make the final decision. I don't know how they come up with that. I actually believe it's only right. It is right. The, the only thing right or wrong is that that person gets to make the decision. If they make a mistake or not, or that's almost beyond right or wrong. When you come to some decisions, not all, but some decisions, that's what makes it right or wrong. That that person got to decide it. End of story. Some things are like that. Is apple pie good? Only the person eating the apple pie can decide if it's good or not. They can be wrong. They can say, oh, it's terrible. Maybe later on, uh, they remember that they were just being bitter and actually they'd liked it and they lied. You know, maybe they made a mistake saying it, it, they didn't think it was good and they found out how they thought was different or they didn't know or they were confused it's right for that person to decide that little tiny decision and sometimes they're big decisions like whether to proc procreate or not okay now the semi-urgical position is, is a wide range of positions which is neither saying you should nor you shouldn't but that it's a personal decision but there is a justification of life in that you can do something about whether life is worth living from your point of view. 
So that's why it's a group, because there's a shared attitude that you can do something. There's some way to probably say in an abstraction what you can do. Okay. Right. One more thing that's a part of it, just because it's got to be, because I'm going to join this group. It, it, there's relativistic skepticism is the name for my epistemology, the way I look at how we construct knowledge. You don't have to agree with that, but you don't have to call yourself a relativist or skeptic or any of that. I don't care. You could say you're objectivist. But you have to be compatible with relativistic skepticism. And relativistic skepticism has one, only one compatibility rule. You are compatible with relativistic skepticism ironic as it might be as much against the tendencies of this epistemology you can't be a hypocrite you have to be against hypocrisy your philosophy even if internally it says you should tell white lies to make people feel good you can't be a hypocrite you can't do something different than your philosophy says. Now, we all do that a little bit, right? We all break the rules of our philosophy. And I've discovered not just by accident, it's also because if you're trying to become a better person, then you move your philosophy in front of your behavior, and your behavior is going to lag behind. And so, not being a hypocrite doesn't mean never violating it. I mean, that's the idea, but it really means that when you violate it, you're honest, you take responsibility, you work to rectify that. And you have two options. You can either, either admit that you have a bigger philosophy that allows for this action, or that you have to do something to rectify your actions, or I, I think ideally a little bit of both. You move here and you realize, well, sometimes people make mistakes or whatever it is. You do a little bit of both. You rectify your action and you change your philosophy. Why do you change your philosophy to accommodate a misdeed? Well, because philosophies aren't perfect and it helps you be more tolerant of other people and their misdeeds. But in relativism, you can judge people by their hypocrisy, by their own rules. People think, oh, relativists can't judge because yes you can people tell you their rules and then you see their action you can see if they hook up okay so um, so that's that so uh, yeah I'm going to make the website be it already has groups I'm going to set up a group system and I want to set up a group and now this is a category an organic category so it's not there is no category in nature right so people aren't uh, of one particular type of thing or another it's like if you think of it a certain way they could be thought of that way and if you think of it another way they could be thought of it that way and, and uh, categories cluster and there's you know blurry edges to categories but there's also clustering and there's relationships between these idealized frames and it's a lot like a uh, schematic you know mathematical uh, geometrical uh, system if you think of categories this way. Well, what I'm getting at is that I may be the only uh, semi-urge that, that says that self-identifying and, you know, you know, also inventing, but it's also a category, so I can see people that I think fit this category. Now I'm going to speculate and I'm if they say no uh, that doesn't sound like I fit that category then fine. They, you know they don't all take their word for it um, but maybe I just haven't stated it clearly enough. But I think uh, the following people are are semi-irish and um, uh, one is Barklord. You know he expressed this that he's not he thinks anti-natalism is a good thing if only it convinces people, you know, for population, you know, we can't, shouldn't just grow and grow and grow. So there is an anti-natalist. It's not full 100% ultra, ultra anti, like there should be zero. It's more like let's slow it down by all kinds of means. And yeah, there's reasons not to and so on. To me, that's a semi-urgical position. 
um, Da Spook, who I always call Do Spook, but it's it's Da Spook. Sorry, and uh, uh, I think he's semi-urgical, where he appreciates both enough to pay attention to the arguments of, and sort of a semi-urgical attitude is, yeah, life's the world's screwed up. Look what we did to the American Indians. Look what's going on in the world the last hundred years or maybe hundred thousand. Oops. So an, an artistic approach to that um, and sort of an irreverent thing here where they're both very well read and um, what's that word again? Your self time. You know, it's, it's great examples. Okay. Um, it apply to. Now, Fred, I'm not sure. Fred has some idealism, like, you know, uh, like Red Light Rocket Matt um, is an idealist. It's not really semiurgical. That's not material security enough. You don't have to believe, call yourself anything. You have to call yourself a materialist, but you have to believe that you got to look at the world, and the world is confusing, and it's you play tricks on yourself. You have to have this kind of an idea. You know, life has an absurdity kind of edge, but you don't have to say, well, life's absurd. But, you know, hopefully you would understand something like the myth of Sisyphus by Camus, but maybe not. You know, there's it's not a labeling. It's anti-labeling. Like my other group was the disassociation. It's like, we agree that we don't have to be alike to be in a group. You know, that's But it's m more sophisticated because there is a definition here about why it's pro-life in some sense, but it's also pro-choosing not to have life. Like, an individual antinatalist that might have reproduced and doesn't has stopped millions of lives, or choose a number, right? You go far enough in advance. But probably, literally, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives within a relatively short uh, span of generations, about a couple thousand years. And so that's a profound thing that I think they have the right to do. There's people you know, I've written books saying go forth and multiply that don't think that, you know, that, that would say those people shouldn't do that, you know. So uh, I endorse that. Uh, but this is pro-life in that, yes, life can be what you make it. And I think in the really bad cases, you can either say this is too bad, I don't want to live, and that's respectable and even brave and admirable. But you can also say, okay, I want to fight it. You know, like, I think in the case of human oppression, it's better to say I'm going to fight. If you're a slave, I think it's better to say I'm going to be a revolutionary. Have kids if you want or not, but I'm going to be, I probably wouldn't. But, yeah, I think it's good if they go on and keep fighting and get their freedom. And it's happened. And it's multi-generational. You know, it's going to take an experiment off of history. You see, you know, what the answers can be. So the other uh, person is Kabich or Sabich or Chabich. Uh, heavy traffic head seems semi-urgical. Now there, you know, there's. I can think of a lot of other people like uh, I kind of thought of Kuras, but I just don't know. Uh, you know, I don't want to say. I feel it's an imposition to, to categorize people, but I'm trying to make a strange exception, like a category of people that say you can't really categorize people but you can because in cognitive science there's an idea of category that is much more organic where you have central categories and prototypes and a person can say oh yeah that prototype fits me but with the following exceptions in the following subcluster or as a following unique case because the real way we categorize deals with the fact that people and things that get categorized are actually unique um, and so there's a lot of other people that I think have uh, semi-urgical tendencies um, uh, and maybe semi-urge, but, uh, but I just wanted to have a seed group and with, um, particularly with Park Lord and, and Das Spook, it's almost like, well, just say what your view is. There's a group of people that are not suburban plastic uh, Church of England uh, let's, life is so splendid while well, they're really miserable inside or not that's not the position it's more that life you know is what you make of it but an artist is limited to their materials as well right you can't make an oil painting if you just have clay 
um, but you can't make an, uh, a clay pot if what you have is oil paint. So, um, more to come. Essentially, the semi-urgical position is that it is possible to be satisfied, right? It doesn't mean that you have to think that you are satisfied. It doesn't mean that you have to think that those that find life satisfactory are not fooling themselves. But you acknowledge that it's possible, therefore if somebody claims it, they sort of it follows, they have the right to, to find that. Now I say that, you know, an Epicurean can be satisfied, Epicurus can be satisfied, Py a Pythagorean can be satisfied, Pythagoras was satisfied. And, uh, you know, even a cynic or a stoic can be satisfied, right? The cynic can be satisfied with free speech and the ability to have an influence on society, right? And point out the things that need to be fixed. And we fix them, and they're still cynical afterwards, and you can go see they're never satisfied, but we get a better society out of that thing. And a stoic, even a stoic, like, life is sucks, but it's good to work hard and make it work. But I never really enjoy it. Okay, I kind of look down on that. I think that's fooling yourself. And it's like, well, that is a satisfaction. They never admit they're satisfied. I say they're satisfied. Uh, the cynic, similarly, would not admit they're satisfied. But I think there's a kind. But whatever, there's one, that, you know, Epicurus was. You know, and if, if the cynic goes, well, I, that guy's fooling himself. Well, he doesn't choose that philosophy. He chooses another one that I say as the skeptic who can certainly be satisfied. That that's his, you know, choice. Yeah, because the skeptic knows how to be satisfied at any moment. That's not even the question. It's be, that's why I choose skepticism, because it's beyond that. You can easily be satisfied at any moment. Easily. Right? No problem, satisfaction at the doorstep at your beck and call. But satisfaction is not the end all be all of reality. So um, that's what you call enlightenment, seeing something like that. Like you're overwhelmed by this question of satisfaction and then you solve it and realize, oh my God, there's, there's actually another problem. And that itself is very unsatisfactory to certain people, like from schools that I didn't just mention. But uh, that's sort of their problem, right? I mean, they're the ones that are afflicted by that. There's always another question, always another problem. Personally, the skeptic, I think, uh, is well positioned easily to, to deal with that and be satisfied because there is another question. Okay.